Thank you everyone for joining us on today's earnings call. I trust and hope that you've all had a good start to the new year, and it's my distinct pleasure to be hosting you on the first earnings call as a listed company. Let me provide the key highlights for the third quarter of fiscal year 2024, and I'll then hand over to Savita to provide more details on our financial performance. From a revenue perspective, in Indian rupees, we recorded aggregate sequential revenue growth of 1.6%, and annualized growth of 14.7%. Q3 tends to be a seasonally soft quarter because of reduced billing days that can largely be attributed to the festivals in India and the Christmas and New Year holidays in other parts of the world. However, our margin performance was much improved, operating EBITDA coming in at 18.3%, compared with 16.9% in the previous quarter. Q3 was also a good quarter in terms of deal signings, with five large deals won during October, November, and December. This includes one deal with a TCV of more than $50 million in our automotive vertical and another $25 million deal in aerospace. The remaining three deals were all in the automotive vertical. Let me give you some further color on these deals. We have been selected by a global automotive OEM to support the rebalancing of their engineering resource pool in North America. This $50 million TCB deal will involve the movement of several hundred roles from onshore locations in the U.S. to offshore delivery centers in India. I'm also happy to inform that we've also won a $25 million multi-year engagement with a large European aerospace OEM in support of the digital transformation of their manufacturing operations. One of the major challenges faced by the aerospace sector is manufacturing throughput. Following the pandemic, demand for aircraft has exceeded the industry's ability to supply. This engagement is focused upon addressing that challenge through the deployment of digital tools, processes, and methods. We've also won a top hat vehicle deal in China. The responsibility for the rollout of a digital thread solution that combines PLM, ERP, and MES tools for a North American new energy vehicle company and a major Autosar engagement with a luxury vehicle manufacturer in the UK. Delivering value to our customers continues to be our primary focus. So let me now provide a brief summary on what's been happening with our top three customers. At Tata Motors, we've recently completed the rollout of a smart manufacturing solution for the new Sanon plant that Tata Motors acquired from the Ford Motor Company in January 2023. We were responsible for architecting and deploying a solution that fully integrates ERP, PLM, MES, and IoT systems that has enabled Tata Motors to increase its annual production capacity by 300,000 units. This agile deployment was achieved in an industry-leading timeline, allowing Tata Motors to commence production earlier this month. At Jaguar and Land Rover, we cement our position at the heart of their digital transformation program by celebrating the deployment of their uh, At Windfast, uh, their focus is pivoting from developing new products to building and selling cars. We've almost completed the development of the two electric vehicles that were outsourced to Tata Technologies on a turnkey basis, and our activities are now transitioning to launch support. This transition began in the second quarter, accelerated in Q3, and will largely be completed in the current quarter. Whilst I'm pleased with the agility that our delivery and resource management teams have shown in redeploying resources, revenues at Windfast materially dropped in Q3. We expect further reductions in the current quarter. Despite this, the services runoff was backfilled with business from other customers, and the impact at an aggregate revenue level was largely mitigated. Outside of our top three customers, traction continues to build, and we remain committed to harvesting the opportunity from this growing base. Indeed, the health of our customer pyramid continues to improve, with 39 customers recording more than a million dollars of annualized services revenue to Tata Technologies in the quarter. This compares with 34 customers in the same period last year. The strategic importance of our customer relationships also continues to improve. During the third quarter, quarter we confirmed a multifaceted partnership with Agritas, the new global battery business of the Tata Group. Today, we have issued a press release that confirms that Agritas 
has selected Tata Technologies to support its ambitions to design, develop, and manufacture high-quality, high-performance, sustainable battery solutions for the global mobility market. The partnership will include a series of engagements that will focus upon battery pack design, the industrialization of the planned gigafactories in India and the UK, together with the implementation of a digital thread that will enable Agritas to track all product and digital assets from concept through design, manufacturing, quality, and service. This partnership will enable Tata Technologies to further expand its upstream electric vehicle capabilities, thus extending our industry-leading electric vehicle proposition. From an offerings perspective, we continue to expand our portfolio of service lines, especially in areas such as software-defined everything, cybersecurity, and autonomy. In October last year, we participated in ELIV in Germany. ELIV is the world's leading event for automotive electronics and software. At the event, we demonstrated a cloud-native cloud architecture for software-defined vehicles, leveraging industry standards such as Autosar and SOFI. We partnered with leading technology players like NXP, ARM, Intel, and Amazon AWS to profile software-defined vehicle platform solutions for high-performance computing, next-generation uh, digital cop cockpit solutions, and cybersecurity. Earlier this month, we also exhibited our software-defined vehicle capabilities at CES and celebrated our emerging partnerships with Intel, ARM, and Foxconn's motion in harmony. As the world of high-tech and mobility converge, the traditional vertically integrated automotive supply chains will likely transform into complex, horizontally structured ecosystems. OEMs and Tier 1 suppliers will have to abandon strategies that are focused upon total control of a vehicle and instead pick and choose their partners. That's why Tata Technologies is committed to building a strategic network of partnerships and alliances to address this structural shift in the industry. To that end, we are delighted to announce two important partnerships that will further reinforce our software-defined vehicle credentials. The first is with Intel. Intel is a leader in compute technology across various industries, and our collaboration with Intel in the automotive space aligns with our vision to leverage cutting-edge technologies in delivering the latest innovations around software-defined vehicles to our customers. We will be utilizing Intel's new range of software-defined vehicle system-on-chip family of products for building software platforms. This partnership marks an important milestone in our software-defined vehicle journey. Together with Intel, we intend to work on a joint go-to-market strategy for our customers in Asia, where we see strong demand for our high-performance compute system-on-chip-based vehicle solutions. The second partnership is with ARM, the SoftBank-owned British Semiconductor and software design company based in Cambridge in the UK. We already have a strong partnership with ARM and have recently developed solutions for SDVs or software-defined vehicles using the SOFI framework that we've demonstrated at ELIV and CES. ARM microprocessor chip architecture represents the world's largest computational footprint. ARM technology underpinned the software, the smartphone, revolution and is ubiquitous in IoT, embedded, mobile, and automotive applications. We are absolutely thrilled to continue to, to collaborate closely with ARM, including working with them on a range of new solutions, bringing cloud-native software architecture for automotive applications into upcoming ARM-based automotive chips. We're looking forward to sharing more detail on these partnerships along with live demonstrations at industry events in the coming months. Our efforts from a customer and a capability perspective continue to attract the attention and respect of industry watch organizations like Zinod. With their recently published industry rankings, Tata Technologies was confirmed for the sixth consecutive year as the number one automotive engineering service provider in India. And in their new EB rankings, Tata Technologies was not only confirmed as number one in India, but number two globally. From the perspective of supply, we remain confident in the growing demand for our services, and so we continue to add delivery capacity. In Q3, we added 174 new team members to our global ER&D and digital delivery teams. We also inaugurated a new innovation center in Coimbatore that will focus on vehicle software. 
Our employee engagement initiatives continue to yield success with the last 12 month voluntary attrition coming down to 15.4% in the quarter compared with 17.2% in Q2. Our annualized, or Q3 annualized attrition was at 13.6%. We continue to invest in talent development activities for our teams. In Q3, we trained over 8,000 employees with more than 1,000 employees trained on Gen AI, AI and ML, and 3,000 employees trained on various aspects of our embedded electronics and software proposition. From a technology solutions perspective, our products and education business delivered strong sequential growth of 5% in INR, fueled largely by our software products business. The products business, which is focused primarily upon our value-added reseller partnerships with the PLM software vendors, typically does well at the end of each calendar year when our customers in the U.S. renew maintenance contracts and discharge year-end budgets. In our education vertical, we've built a large order book. This has allowed revenue to be smoother and much more predictable than in prior years. We expect this to continue. Overall, despite the short-term headwinds associated with the runoff at Winfast, customer demand remains resilient, and we are well positioned for a very strong start to FY25. With that, let me hand it over to Savita to give an update on the details of our Q3 financial performance. Thank you, Warren. Good morning or good evening, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. And thank you for joining this call today. Continuing on the details that Warren shared about how our business is shaping up, let me share with you the financial performance in the third quarter. Overall, the results were resilient with a solid margin profile in a quarter that tends to be seasonally slow due to the festive holidays in various parts of the world. Our revenue from operations grew 1.6% sequentially to $12,895 million for the quarter. On a year-on-year -year basis, the growth in revenue was 14.7%. On a constant currency basis, total revenues grew 1.9% sequentially from Q2 and 11.6% on a year-on-year -year basis. Breaking this down into the two segments that we operate in, revenue from services segment, which formed about 78% of our revenues in this quarter, was up 0.6% quarter on quarter to clock a top line of about 10 billion rupees. This segment was impacted by holidays and the ramp down in one of our mega full vehicle program as the project nears the launch phase. And this was partly backfilled by growth in other accounts. In US dollar constant currency terms, revenues were down 0.5% sequentially. In the technology solution segment, grew by 5.2% over Q2 to clock a revenue of 2.89 billion rupees, largely supported by the renewal deals that is characteristic of the final quarter of the calendar year in the products business. The year-on-year -year growth was a more robust 38.9%, supported by increased delivery in our education business this year, compared with the previous financial year, which was heavily back-ended, with only a third of our annual revenues in this business clocked in the first nine months, given the project stage and the state of infrastructure readiness by our customers. On operating margin, increased by 140 basis points sequentially to 18.3% in Q3, driven by improved services gross margins. That's all increased offshoring, reduced spend on outsourced costs as we ramped down or replaced contractors in line with our revenue profile, as well as to some extent better revenue quality in Q3 against some of the pass-through business that we had in Q2 relating to test and validation work for our projects. We recognize an other income of about 307 million rupees during the quarter. Consequentially, our EBIT was up 11.3% sequentially and up 5.2% year on year to 2,094 million rupees. In line with the improvement witnessed in the operating EBITDA margin, EBIT margin also expanded 140 basis points sequentially to 16.2% during the December quarter. Our effective tax rate was 27.6%, and the sequential increase was driven by a higher percentage of profits coming from India and the UK this quarter compared with the previous quarter. 
Net income increased by 14.7% year on year to 1,702 million rupees, representing 13.2% of our operating revenues. Coming to balance sheet, we have continued to remain focused on strong liquidity with $132.5 million in net cash at the end of third quarter. This compares to $120 million that we had at the end of September. The total DSO, billed and unbilled, stood at 95 days at the end of December versus 92 days at the end of Q2. The increase in bill DSO from 73 to 81 days was more invoicing as we hit certain milestones in our delivery-based projects, while the unbilled DSO reduced from 19 to 15 days. Overall, the DSO remains within a target range of 90 to 110 days. Coming to cash flows, our free cash flow stood at 2,198 million rupees in Q3, and we continue to strive to further improving our cash collections and conversion levels. Let me now give you some color on the operational metrics. Our headcount increased by 172 employees sequentially. Our total employee count stood at 12,623 at the end of the quarter. And as Warren referenced in his comments, we are in the process of redeploying resources who are coming off the large full vehicle projects, and we should see utilization levels improve as these actions take effect. Attrition levels have continued to come down and stood at 15.4% compared with 17.2% in second quarter, as we continue to see positive impact from our employee engagement measures, as well as an overall reduction in the industry-wide attrition levels. Our employee cost increased by 2.9% sequentially, driven by about 3% increase in our average headcount during the quarter. And this was more than offset by an 18% sequential reduction in our outsourcing and consulting charges as we continue to optimize our cost base. Our customer pyramid, which shows the number of customers with a million dollar plus in revenue has continued to show steady improvement. I'd like to specifically call out customers in the one to five million dollar category, which has increased to 29 in third quarter compared to 24 in the same quarter last year. As far as the on-site and offshore mix is concerned, mix has moved in favor of offshore this quarter. Of our total services revenue, offshore revenue improved to 56% from 54.5% in Q2. As a percentage of the offshoreable revenues, which references revenues that we source from outside our delivery centers in India and Romania, 39.5% of revenue was delivered offshore compared to 37% in the previous quarter. And we continue to work on measures to gradually improve this metric. And before we open up the call for Q&A, I can conclude my remarks by saying, we'll continue to make the necessary investments in building capabilities and capacity in the areas of industry focus such as SDV, embedded, alternative propulsion systems, and autonomous to create the runway for sustained growth. At the same time, we maintain our focus on operational efficiencies and keeping our cost base competitive. Our long-term levers of margin expansion continue to focus on increasing offshoring, moving towards an optimal people pyramid, and operating leverage as our business scales. Thank you. We can now open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star N1 on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star N2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Abhishek Kumar from JM Financial. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, thanks for taking my question, Warren, uh, and, and uh, congratulations on a very good uh, operating performance. Uh, my first question is uh, on uh, on the outlook, uh, especially around Vinfar. I'm going to interrupt um, you, sir. Uh, may I request you to use your answer, sir? Your audio is slightly muffled, sir. Sure. Thank That's you. Really nice. Uh, hi, uh, is this better? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question and congratulations uh, on a good um, operating performance. Uh, Warren, I uh, wanted to, uh, you know, pick your brain uh, around Outlook uh, on WinFAR specifically first. Uh, you said uh, <clears throat> uh, you expect uh, some drop in Q4 as well. I uh, wanted to understand uh, if, you know, Q4 will probably be the last of uh, the decline in this account and then we can see uh, some stability or, uh, you know, how should we, uh, you know, think about, uh, you know, WinFast given that most of the programs you're working on are coming to an end. Yeah, th thanks, Avashak, and it's, uh, it's great to hear from you. Um, in, in terms of, um, uh, of WinFast, you know, as I positioned in the, uh, in the opening comments, you know, we uh, we began the uh, the transition from engineering and uh, and developing the uh, the two EVs that uh, that we've been responsible for. We began the transition to uh, to launch support in uh, in Q2. Uh, that accelerated in uh, in Q3, and we'll be largely through that transition at the end of uh, of Q4. So as we go into uh, FY25. The, uh, the base will, uh, will largely be, uh, unaffected by any, uh, any volatility or change at, uh, at Winfast. So, you know, we, uh, we expect a slight tapering of growth in, uh, in Q4. But as we go into, uh, into the next fiscal year, you know, we're very bullish about our, uh, our prospects for Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. Great. Just one quick follow-up on Winfast. We heard, uh, you know, Winfast plan to enter, uh, you know, India uh, and, and set up factory here. Uh, does that give us, uh, you know, uh, you know, scope of uh, improving that relationship and maybe expanding it? Uh, and, and therefore, should we expect some growth, you know, once they enter India? You know, I think with uh, with with as with many new energy vehicle companies. Um, when they uh, when they develop a uh, product, uh, they develop the first products that uh, that underpin their portfolio. They uh, they quickly uh, shift to uh, to uh, building product and uh, and to selling product, and that's the uh, the phase that Winfast are uh, are in. And I think that their their prospects for uh, for further expansion and uh, and for Expanding the, uh, the manufacturing capacity is going to be somewhat dependent and linked to the success of, uh, of the current portfolio. So uh, we, uh, we're very proud of the relationship um, with, uh, with Winfast. Um, we, uh, we're very excited about the impact that they can have on the overall market. But the timing for, uh, for when they, uh, they come here uh, to India and the, and the timing associated with, with when they will uh, Will launch new uh, new product um, investments is uh, is still from our perspective still somewhat up in the air. Okay, uh, one last question from my side on on the last deal that you mentioned, fifty million dollar deal. Uh, you know the rebalancing of engineering resources from US to India. It, it sounds a little counterfactual to the you know insourcing trend that we hear in the market. I just wanted to understand, is it because, uh, you know, the OEMs are increasingly under budget constraints and therefore, uh, you know, that is driving higher offshoring? Is, is that, uh, you know, kind of driven by that? And if, if so, uh, do you see this kind of trend uh, accelerating going forward? Thank you. You know, I, I think if, if you look at, at the uh, the North American market and, uh, and you look at um, – at uh, Detroit specifically, uh, I think despite the uh, the investments that have, uh, have been made in offshoring, a, uh, a substantial part of uh, of the Detroit resource pool that is uh, is leveraged by the uh, the big three and uh, and the tier ones is uh, is is somewhat still dependent upon staffing companies, and uh, and I think that um, that. Uh, given the uh, the need to invest in capacity and new skills, I think all uh, of the uh, the companies that uh, that define the at uh, the North American market, I think they're increasingly looking uh, to India and uh, and to offshore locations like Eastern Europe to satisfy that new demand, and that's really what um, what this deal is uh, is focused upon. You know, as the clock speed of technology change continues to accelerate, 
you know, the, the, the access to local talent is, uh, is done. Uh, great, that's very helpful. Uh, thank you and uh, all the best, Ron. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Jay Fleshow from Grayson Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Hello, Warren. Um, you made some very interesting remarks concerning the um, evolution of the automotive ecosystem as you see it, and as well your own evolution in terms of your offerings and now your partnership announcements. Um, with that in mind, two things, if I may. Number one, um, what are you seeing in terms of your engagement uh, or, or pipeline with regard to functions uh, that complement PLM? And I have in mind specifically, for example, um, simulation, um, ALM, and other associated applications. Are you beginning to see more demand uh, for those functions to complement your PLM uh, implementation work? And then with regard to the partnerships, uh, the comments about Intel and ARM are, are quite interesting. Would it stand for reason that you could take that a step further and also partner with um, any role of the, uh, the EDA companies, uh, such as Siemens, with whom you already have a relationship, um, or the others, to, to further deepen um, your, your exposure to the electronics world? Yeah, it's great to hear from you, uh, Jay. And uh, and again, thanks for the for joining in uh, joining the conference call, and uh, thanks for the uh, for the questions. You know, I think there's a number of uh, of of questions in there, and uh, and I think if I answered them comprehensively, we'd probably be on the uh, on the call all night. But I, I think you know, just in in terms of summary, I, I think if we look at the work that we're doing with uh, with the companies that we're working with on the digital side. I think increasingly, you know, we are looking at uh, comprehensive, you know, digital twin and digital digi digital thread initiatives that uh, that extend beyond um, PLM, certainly uh, ALM, and uh, and into uh, to manufacturing execution systems and uh, and and ERP systems. And uh, one of the things that I think is really defined the difference that matters that we represent is uh, is the ability to be able to integrate those uh, those platform platforms in a way that's aligned and uh, and and uh, and and required by the uh, by the industry and the uh, and the companies that um, that we are working with and uh, and we certainly uh, see that um, that analysis and simulation is a uh, is a key component of uh, of that and some of our most recent uh, implementations of, uh, of, of profiles, the, uh, the, the value that can be crystallized if, um, if, you can, uh, if you can get the integration right and you can align that to, uh, to an optimized product development process. Now, as far as the, um, the relationships with, um, with the chip manufacturers, you know, they, uh, they are relationships that, um, that we are very excited about. And I reference that, um, you know, the industry is going through a transition from a, uh, a supply chain that was, uh, was somewhat vertical and controlled by the OEM to a, uh, a horizontal um, uh, ecosystem that, uh, that is somewhat dependent upon the contribution from, uh, from multiple players. And, uh, and I think partnerships and alliances are going to define the industry going forward, and uh, and we are very excited about you know being able to uh, to um, to uh, to really form a, a meaningful relationship with uh, with the type of companies that we believe will uh, will be a major player. And obviously, Intel and ARM are major players today, but I think the strategies and the commitment that they are making to the mobility sector certainly give us, gives us confidence that they're going to grow their influence. And, uh, and by association, we expect to make a big contribution towards their, their plans. Very good. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Shitij Saraf from Tusk Investments. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening. Uh, congratulations on the consistency in the performance. Uh, my 
first question is on the partnership. So uh, we have ARM as a partner and uh, we have Intel as a partner. So uh, with Intel, we primarily intend to focus on the APAC and uh, with ARM in the European region. Is that understanding kind of correct? Um, no, um, the um, the solutions that we're looking to deploy, um, we will um, we will take to the markets um, globally, uh, but specifically in uh, in Asia Pacific, uh, we have uh, we've agreed to work with uh, with uh, Intel on a uh, on a joint go to market uh, proposition that will be focused upon um, uh, Southeast Asia and specifically China. So that's uh, that's an extension of the uh, of the technical um, partnership that we're uh, we're celebrating uh, um, that we're celebrating today. Okay, and uh, the Tata uh, Group overall announced the collaboration with uh, NVIDIA for the Drive platform uh, with relation to 2026-27 launches. So, would Tata Technologies play a role in in that whole piece? You know, we're not at liberty um, because of confidentiality agreements to, uh, to share specifics of, uh, of what we're doing for, uh, for different customers. Uh, but rest assured, um, with regard to JLR and, uh, and TML, uh, we're involved in, uh, in all aspects of, uh, of their product development process. And so when, uh, when announcements of that type are made, um, you can have confidence that Tata Technologies is involved. Got it. That's very helpful. Uh, lastly, uh, Warren, on the client pyramid and the mining efforts, how, how is the pipeline for the large deals uh, shaping up? How does it work for you guys? Uh, does it so happen that the one to 50 odd million uh, bracket engagements, they, they become into a more holistic sort of end-to-end -end solution? Or does it start from a large contract win from a new customer? Any light? Um, they would be really helpful. You know, I, I think the um, the architecture and the specifics of uh, of large deals uh, vary from uh, from customer to customer, engagement uh, to engagement. Um, but what I will say is that um, that we are targeting large deals both in terms of our hunting activities and in terms of the. Uh, the um, relationships that we have with our existing customers. One of the things that we've been focusing on is, uh, is proactive architecting of, uh, of large propositions that address the unmet needs of our customers. And, uh, and that, um, that investment and, uh, and that capability that we are, we are building is, uh, is in part what's informed progress that we're making on the large deal front. Very helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, congratulations and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to all participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. Our next question is from the line of Karan Opal from Philip Capital India. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. So, Warren, uh, so first question is uh, on, on EVs. So we have seen uh, some bit of a customer uh, you know, adoption which has slowed down in EVs in US and Europe uh, due to multiple reasons. So uh, we have a very strong factors in EV segment. So will it have any impact on, on our business due to this? Yeah, that's a great question and, uh, and a question that we've, uh, we've been asked um, uh, multiple times since the, um, the statements from uh, from companies like GM and Ford and uh, and to uh, to a lesser extent the likes of uh, of Toyota, you know our our view uh, is um, that the pendulum swing has uh, has been affected within the automotive industry in terms of the move to alternative propulsion systems. You know all of the projects that we are currently involved with uh, from a product development perspective. Almost all of the projects have some form of electrification, and uh, and if you look at where our, where the industry is uh, is investing, you know we are we're quite confident that um, that the thrust towards the skill sets and capabilities that we have 
will not only uh, continue, but it will uh, sustain, you know, through uh, the extended, um, you know, the extended period over the next five to ten um, years. You know, I think that there are uh, some specific things that are influencing the North American uh, market. I think that there is um, is concerns about um, the uh, the change in the White House at the end of the year and the impact that that will have on the Inflation Reduction Act. And, that, and that there may be things like that that will play out in, uh, in different parts of the world. And I think that that could have a, a, an impact on, uh, on demand and, uh, and the number of units that are sold. But I do not believe that it's, uh, it's going to impact the investment in, uh, in new product. Uh, we are uh, typically, when we're engaged to develop product for our customers, we're investing in what will define the competitive position of our customers in three and four years' time. And, uh, and we do not see, at the moment, any compromise or slowdown in, uh, in the demand that, um, that we've been building our thesis around for, uh, for the last three to four years. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for the detailed answer. Uh, second question is uh, regarding the services segment. So in, in services, uh, we have seen a growth rate of close to double digits this, uh, you know, in this quarter and in H1 it was around mid-teens. So considering the drag from WinFast, uh, uh, how should we think about the growth in services segment, uh, for, for FY25? You know, as I said before, I, I think that the, um, the transition from engineering to, uh, to launch support um, it impacted Q3. We, uh, we expect, um, we expect um, further runoff in, uh, in Q4, and so growth um, will uh, taper. Um, but we'll be large, largely through it um, come the end of, uh, of February, uh, March, March um, timeframe. And so as we go into FY25, you know, the base will be solid, and we expect to continue the growth trajectory that, uh, that we've been on for the last uh, three years. So we're extremely bullish about next year. And, uh, and we anticipated what was happen what's happened at, uh, at Windfast. We've planned and we've prepared for it. So this is not a surprise. Okay. And last question uh, is on margins. So the margins have seen, you know, very smart expansion over the last three years. And right in this quarter also we have seen a margin expansion. So from medium term perspective, how are you thinking about, uh, you know, margins are, are they optimized or do you think there's still room for expansion going ahead? I'll let, uh, I'll let Sabita take that one. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, you're right, I think there's been a lot of concerted effort to look at improving our uh, cost base and our operational efficiencies. Um, and the result of that is what you've seen as part of our margin expansion story. Uh, aided, of course, uh, by growth that we've uh, enjoyed as well. Uh, and if you look at within the industry, um, uh, one would say that uh, our peers of similar size tend to operate at the same level that we are at right now, somewhere between 18 to 18 and a half percent. Um, and that's the band that at this point we want to consistently be able to deliver. And as we continue to grow and scale our business, um, the North Star uh, in the medium to long term would be to try and build another 200 to 250 basis point on top of this level, and, and that's the kind of goal post we'll try and move the business towards. Any timeline you're looking at for this 200 to 250 expansion? Sorry, could you repeat your question? I'm saying uh, any timeline you're looking at for this 200 to 250 bits expansion, maybe over the next one year, two years. At this point in time, I'm afraid I, we won't be able to put a specific timeline on it. Um, but as the business scales, one should be able to see benefits of that flowing through to margins um, through both operating leverage and efficiency improvements. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks a lot and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ashish D from JM Mutual Funds. Please go ahead. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so we do understand that we also have an engagement with Airbus. Uh, so as far as the recent development is concerned, wherein you know Airbus and Tata uh, will be manufacturing H125 single-engine helicopters, uh, 
again based out of gujarat facility uh, so if you could help us understand our engagement the entire scheme of things uh, you said that uh, we are involved with tata motors and jr in almost every aspect uh, so would it be fair to assume that as far as airbus and tata group contracts are concerned to be there uh, spread out across uh, pretty nicely again i uh, i'm not at liberty to um, to confirm the specifics of um of the engagement that um that we have with uh with tassel or airbus but what i will say is that um we uh we were accredited by airbus some uh, some 18 months ago um we uh, we're now part of their emes uh, cubed uh, supply program uh, that uh that program is uh is a program that um that supports over 2 billion euros of uh, of annualized uh, outsource uh, spend and uh and increasingly that spend is uh is coming to uh to india uh, we are the only um accredited uh tata group engineering service provider um the relationship between airbus and uh, and the tata group uh, continues to grow not just with the uh, c295 uh, engagement with uh, with tassel but also through the um the investment that air india have made in uh in terms of uh, a new aircraft that uh, that will uh will uh, be coming into the fleet in uh in the next uh, couple of of years and uh, and we believe that the tailwinds associated with uh, with that partnership will provide a uh, significant opportunity for uh for tata technology so we are we're excited uh, about the relationship with uh with airbus uh, we've invested in uh, in opening up facilities in uh, in toulouse and hamburg uh, we've had a long standing relationship with uh with tassel uh, we have a relationship with uh with air india and uh and we expect to continue to support all of those organizations as we build out our aerospace proposition in the future and would we have a similar engagement with boeing as well um we've worked with boeing um for many many years um i uh i worked in uh in the 90s um with uh, uh through the partnership that we have with uh, with daso systems on uh, on the first digital aircraft the uh the 777 uh, we were also a uh, a major uh, supplier to their plm initiatives in and around the uh, the 787 uh, we uh we have um a number of technical engagements with uh, with boeing at the moment and are in discussions with regard to uh to scaling that and making that uh, that relationship into something that's meaningful to both organizations so we uh we do have ambitions to uh to uh, to build out our partnership with uh with boeing but well, this is helpful so and last week uh, our uh, our proportion of services business and the technology business to our overall revenues uh so 80% of the revenue is coming from services part but so that should remain stable or you envisage uh, a higher percentage contribution as we go ahead into the years you know i think our ambitions are to uh how to scale the services business at a faster rate than the technology solutions uh, business technology solutions business is important to us because it helps us maintain the relationship with the technology vendors that uh that provide the technology stack on which manufacturing companies uh do uh, business and so it uh it's important in terms of revenue but it's more important in terms of the uh the strategic contribution that it makes to our business so our ambitions in terms of growth for technology solutions is uh is somewhat lesser than the ambitions that we have for our services business. Yeah, this is very helpful. Thanks and all the best. Thank you. A reminder to all participants, you may press star and 1 to ask a question. Our next question is from the line of Shitit Saraf from Tusk Investments. Please go ahead. uh yeah thank you again uh, if i could just chip in with one more question uh we have 80 odd percent of uh, revenues within services uh, segment from the auto industry so uh, going forward how do we see uh, this mix shifting uh, because we have aerospace and the tailwinds there off uh, and uh, there is a mention of uh, helping the world farm as well so 
in context of that is in that uh, industrial heavy machinery and any sort of work uh, that you're doing you could share and uh, what's building in the pipeline and what sort of capabilities are around would be really helpful yeah it's a, it's a great um, great question and uh, and I think just in terms of how we are looking at um, at the industry diversification in the, in the business you know we continue at our heart um, to uh, to focus upon the uh, the mobility sector um, we are um, recognized by Zinoff as the number one automotive engineering service provider in uh, in India and I think our, our proposition you know our full vehicle our full uh, turnkey capabilities that we have in uh, in automotive that extend uh, beyond mechanical into uh, embedded electronics and software defined vehicles. I think that proposition continues to uh, to differentiate ourselves and uh, and by association represents significant opportunity and we want to harvest that opportunity. So we're going to stay focused upon uh, automotive. Uh, but aerospace is uh, is a uh, is a business. That um, that is uh, is it represents a much smaller base, and so in percentage terms, given the uh, the relationship that we've established with Airbus specifically, and given the investments that the group is make, making, uh, we expect the uh, the growth rate of aerospace to extend and exceed the uh, the growth in uh, in automotive. Um, with um, with transport, construction, and heavy machinery. You know, typically that industry lags automotive by three to four years. And so the, uh, the move to electrification, connected, autonomous, and shared, we're starting to see that in the, uh, the farm equipment and the construction equipment space. And many of the skills and experiences that we've capitalized in, uh, in automotive are directly fungible to the opportunity that that vertical represents. So we certainly see... Uh, that uh, the aerospace, transport, construction, and heavy machinery in three to five years' time will likely make up a bigger percentage of, uh, of our services mix than they do today. But, um, but that, um, you know, continues to, uh, to, but I would continue to reinforce that, um, that we are not going to be uh, diverted for, from the, uh, the, um, the material and the sizable opportunity that we continue to see in uh, in automotive. Thank you. Uh, all the best. Congratulations. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kirish Pai from Nirmal Bang Equities Private Limited. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Warren, you mentioned that FI25 is going to see robust growth. Uh, on the one hand, uh, whereas you're saying that FinFast, which is probably a largish kind of customer, uh, which constituted almost like 20-25% of revenues in FY23, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know the number for FY24, uh, will wind down by 4Q. So what is going to, uh, you know, replace that in FY25 and still deliver robust growth? Again, uh, great question, and uh, and so in in terms of of, of um, in terms of our um, business plan and expectations for uh, for next year, you know we um, we are working with our automotive customers on uh, on the move to electrification and uh, and the move to connected and software defined vehicles, and uh, and increasingly. We are seeing a shift um, of investment um, from mechanical systems into the new tech areas. And that's why we've invested very hev heavily in terms of capacity in those areas uh, and also in terms of capability. And that's why the, uh, the partnerships with Agritas, uh, the partnerships with Intel, and the partnerships with ARM are so important. And, uh, and so our... our, our Expectations uh, for growth next year are informed by order book and, uh, and informed by pipeline in and around uh, those, uh, those vectors. You know, we also see um, with, um, with aerospace that, um, that we, will, uh, we, will, uh, we will significantly improve the, uh, the contribution from Airbus um, 
um, as a customer. You know, we uh, we were impaneled 18 months ago. Uh, we have um, uh, gone through the uh, the accreditation process at Airbus. Airbus is a very regulated uh, company, and so we've had to to demonstrate compliance in uh, in multiple areas. Uh, we've uh, we've opened offices in uh, in Toulouse and uh, in Hamburg, and during that time, we've uh, we've built up a sizable order book, and we expect to discharge that uh, next year. So the uh, the order book and trust book that we've uh, we've built in uh, in automotive together with the pipeline, and the expectations that we have in and around uh, accounts like Airbus are really inspiring the confidence that we have about the next fiscal year. Okay. Uh, my second question, uh, Warren, uh, in one of your media interviews, uh, I think prior to the IPO, you mentioned that uh, the exposure to the Tata Group, not just uh, Tata Motors and JLR, was to the extent of almost 43%, if I'm not mistaken. And you made a point that that is up. Uh, so is it going to come from Tata Motors, JLR, or some other entities within the Tata Group? Yeah, I, I would um, I would distinguish um, the Tata Motors Group from uh, from other Tata Group companies. Um, Agritas is a, uh, a subsidiary of, uh, of Tata Sons, not uh, not the Tata Motors Group. Uh, in terms of um, in terms of percentages, last year uh, Tata Motors and JLR at an aggregate revenue level uh, represented less than 33%. Because of the uh, the confidence that both of those organizations have, given their recent success, they've increased CapEx over the last 12 months. And that CapEx investment, and, uh, and these are uh, public domain um, uh, numbers, that CapEx uh, investment is expected to rise somewhat exponentially. And, uh, and so we um, clearly want to harvest that opportunity. And, uh, and so we are bullish about the, uh, the growth at Tata Motors and, uh, and JLR. And as a result, in the short term, we expect the, uh, the percentage contribution from the Tata Motors group uh, to, uh, to spike up a little bit. But I think medium to long term, the trend that we've been on for the last 10 years is likely to continue. And, uh, and I certainly would expect uh, in uh, in three to five years' time, the uh, the contribution from Tata Motors Group to uh, diminish in percentage term because of the growth that we see outside of uh, of the group. Now, you know, typically within the group, um, in the past, we've worked with organisations like Tata Steel, we've worked with uh, with Tassel, and uh, and we've worked with Air India, and we'll continue to uh, to um, Cultivate independent relationships with uh, with those organisations. But the uh, the partnership that I guess I'm most excited about at the moment is the partnership with uh, with Agritas. The group is making a major investment in uh, in gigafactories. Uh, there will uh, be a need for uh, pack engineering and pack design capabilities. Uh, we will uh, will have the opportunity to partner with them in terms of industrialising. The plants in uh, in Gujarat in, uh, and in the UK, and in deploying the digital tools that will enable the uh, the development of uh, a product and the uh, the optimization of how they run the operations and specifically uh, drive the uh, the smart manufacturing solutions into the into the gigafactory. So very very excited about the uh, the partnership that we've announced today and uh, and the potential that augurs uh, in the future. As I said in my opening comments, it really extends upstream the Tata Technologies capabilities. Traditionally, we've uh, we've taken responsibility for systems integration of uh, of batteries and battery management systems, and uh, and this partnership will uh, will afford us the opportunity to build and cultivate capabilities in and around the uh, the engineering and the design and the development of. Uh, of batteries, um, not just for the uh, for the automotive industry, uh, but also for uh, for the two wheeler uh, and the uh, and the three wheeler space, and also uh, non mobility um, products that require batteries in the future. Uh, my last question uh, is with regard to uh, what you're seeing in the pipeline. Uh, 
uh, the size of orders, uh, the largest order would be of what size? Would it be like uh, somewhere around 100 million to 50 million or 500 million? What is the approximate size of the largest order that you see in your pipeline? You know, we all that I will say as far as um, order book and pipeline is concerned is that um, that we are confident that the order book and the pipeline will support the ambitions that we have for growth uh, next year. You know, we don't disclose uh, specific customer order book information, and we don't uh, disclose the uh, the aggregate order book um, uh, information. Uh, I would just say again that we are confident that we have a sufficient platform. And, uh, and sufficient opportunity to uh, to realize the type of growth that's expected of this of this sector. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, due to time constraint, that was the last question of our question and answer session. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Vijay Loya for closing comments. Thank you everyone for joining us on the call today. We hope that we've been able to answer most of your questions. If there are any further questions, please do get in touch with our investor relations team and we will be happy to answer all your questions. Goodbye from all of, his, all of us here at the management team. Thank you. On behalf of Tata Technologies, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines.